Orbiting Eve in a single stage has for a long time been one of KSP's most interesting and difficult challenges. Even after the heavy gravity and thick atmosphere was overcome and it was shown to be possible, the tight margins on this mean that it remains an extremely difficult engineering problem where everything has to be maximized to pull it off. Starting off, it was just proofs of concepts, then novelties where the plane could just get itself to orbit. But when I was finally able to get a plane from the surface of EVE to Kerbin on a single stage, that segment between Kerbin orbit and getting home to Kerbin showed that we had some usable mass available for payload here. What we're going to take on in this video is building a plane that applies what I've learned here towards building something that's going to be a useful EVE cargo plane ultimately with the goal of using this in an EVE colony. Years ago, I had a series where I built an EVE colony, but this plane, along with some of the other new stuff we've gotten, like the robotics parts, will allow me to make one that's much more functional this time. In keeping with the practicality of this, I'm going to stay away from stuff like part clipping and some of the more extreme exploitation of the aerodynamic model in this game. In terms of scale, I want this to be big. I want it to be able to bring a large payload from the surface of EVE to orbit. But I'm not going to be trying to build this as large as possible. That starts getting to the point where it's just going to run badly on my computer, and I do want to actually be able to use this thing in the future. The cargo plane here is designed for a takeoff mass of 2,229 tons, which will change a bit depending on the size of the fairing needed. Determining how much of that is, is payload is a bit of a definitional question. As is, we have a payload of 128 tons, but that doesn't count an additional 10 tons of fairing and an additional 2 tons that's for the loading and unloading of the payload. As a result, we have a total takeoff payload ratio of somewhere between 5.7 and 6.1% depending on what you count as payload. I'm going to get this mission started and then talk more about the design of it as it progresses. One of the goals for this mission is that this will be able to take off and land from sea level on EVE, so it uses a combination of the Mammoth rocket engines and a ducted fan propeller system. It is not very well optimized for flying on Kerbin. This is designed purely for being able to fly well on EVE, but it will be able to get there on its own by using the rocket engines to help get off the ground and then use the ducted fans to climb to a higher altitude. One of the obvious features of this is its size. There's a definite advantage to economy of scale in Kerbal Space Program. As you scale up your design enough, the mass of parts like probe cores becomes vanishingly insignificant. We also benefit from using the 5 meter S4 fuel tanks. While these generate more body drag than smaller fuel tanks, the, the ratio of fuel they hold relative to how much body drag they generate is very small, which makes this a really slippery design. In addition to the ducted fans and the mammoth engines, I also have a cluster of LVNs on here, 24 of them actually. We'll see more of the exact usage of each of these when we get to the EVE ascent, but I wanted to talk a little bit about why I didn't use the ion engines on this. If you went in with only the goal of maximizing payload efficiency on getting to EVE orbit, you wouldn't want to use a lot of ion engines, but it would make sense to use just a couple to do the final circularization. However, I wanted this to be something that could be used practically as part of an EVE colony, so it's important to me that we used only fuel that could be replenished in ISRU using the mining systems. EVE planes, especially those with a combination of propeller and rocket engines, get very complicated in terms of all the different things you can do with them. So I'm just going to talk about a few of the most interesting features of the design. Loading and unloading the payload was another difficult challenge. I wanted to be able to bring payloads that were a lot bigger than the MK3 cargo bay, which means I had to use a fairing but it's a little bit tricky to get things in and out of a fairing, but it has become a lot easier with the new robotic parts. While attached to the craft, the payload will not have interaction with the fairing of the plane, which will allow me to unload it, and then by reattaching it, I'll be able to load it back in. I'm going to keep the payload a secret for a little bit longer, so we'll find that out later. 
Deciding what angle I wanted to mount the wings at was a difficult decision. The ideal angle of attack from the wings changes depending on what speed we're going at. There's also parts during the ascent where I really could use a lot more lift than the wings are going to be giving me, and parts where I don't want as much lift as what the wings are giving me. I settled on 3 degrees, which is a compromising value. It's not ideal for really any of the parts of the ascent, but there aren't any parts where it's absolutely terrible either. Rigidity is a big challenge when you're building a plane on this scale, and auto strut can become tempting with something this large, but the S4 field tanks are just naturally really rigid, which solved this problem before it even began. One question that I hope you've asked yourselves already is where are the ducted fan propellers? I've mounted them in the main field tanks at the center of mass. I dealt with a lot of issues with the strikes of the Kraken when it was mounted anywhere else. I wasn't thrilled about the idea of putting this inside a field tank because I am trying to avoid clipping here. But it ended up just being the thing that made this work really well and be bug free and be actually fun to fly. The ducted fan blades allow for a really compact design, which means this entire thing can be mounted inside a 2.5 meter utility bay, which means that when we're not using them, it can be closed and they can go back to generating no drag. They're also a bit susceptible to heating, so this will help for our EVE reentry. One of the parts here that I haven't used much before is the magnificently large Kerbodyne adapter cluster. To be honest with you, I was very motivated to use this because it looks really cool. But the drag dynamics of it were better than I expected. The drag on the Kerbodyne adapter itself is about what you'd expect from an S4 part given how much feel it had. You do need then to attach additional adapters to it to get back up to the radius of the Mammoth engine from each part of the cluster, which adds more drag than it really should. But it didn't affect the overall performance that much, and I think it looks great. In practice, I see this plane as being refueled either by a surface base on EVE or a mining operation on Gilly. So the plane does not have its own mining equipment. However, I have included mining equipment with the payload on this, which makes the pre-mission part of this more convenient. Now that we're in low EVE orbit, our mission is truly going to begin. This is the part of this that this has been actually dedicated and designed for. To fulfill the first criteria of what this was designed for, this is going to be landed with the exact fuel loadout that it needs to get to orbit and the payload that it is intended to bring to orbit. To succeed here, I'll have to aero break, glide, and fly to a landing without burning up in Eve's atmosphere and without using any fuel. The difficulty with deorbiting EVE planes full on feel has always been that if you have an appropriate amount of wings, it's just impossible to glide to stay high enough, long enough, to slow down enough so you don't get too low too fast and burn up. Sure enough, as I start slowing down and the difference between gravity and centripetal acceleration gets bigger, I run out of lift on the wings while I'm still going at a dangerous speed. The solution to this is to give up on the attempt to glide, face the nose radial, and just maximize drag. This was achieved through very careful balancing of the center of mass of this craft, which was made possible by the ability to move the feel between the big-ass space plane wings. This does result in being over 7 Gs for about 10 seconds, so this is perhaps not ideal if I ever use this for passengers, but it does work. Now that we're down at the low atmosphere of EVE, I'm going to spin up the ducted fans and we're going to look around for an ideal landing spot. The next problem I had with trying to land this full on field is that a 2.3 kiloton space plane in the intense EVE gravity liked to just break the plane no matter how many landing gear I added, so I decided to cut the Gordian knot and get around this challenge. The seaplane capability of this was really a happy accident. I was having so much problems landing it with the landing gear that I figured I'd just give it a shot at landing on the water and it just worked right away with no problems. 
This also gave me an idea for how to solve the problems related to unloading and loading a 128 pound payload. We're now on Eve and it's time to find out what has been hidden inside the fairing the whole time. Our payload is a generously sized Eve submarine. This has two sets of propellers. The first is optimized for using under the Explodium C. It's not the fastest KSP submarine ever, but still considerably faster than a real life submarine, so I'm calling that a success. I said there was two sets of propellers on this. The other set is designed to be used in the atmosphere of Eve. By bringing it to the surface and then opening the main MK3 cargo bays, it decreases its buoyancy enough that it lifts itself high enough in the explodium such that these air propellers are above the surface. They then can be used to lift the thing vertically out of the sea. These propellers are also mounted on a hinge, which means that once we've gained a little bit of altitude, they can be rotated forward and allow for horizontal flight. I did want to make sure that this worked as both a plane and submarine at the same mass necessary to achieve the neutral buoyancy that makes it a submarine. It does obviously fly a lot better, especially at higher altitudes with less fuel in it. It does pack a drain valve and mining equipment, so the mass can be changed fairly quickly on the fly, at least if you have an engineer. And we have room for at least five Kerbals on board, so at least... As long as one of them knows how to repair a drill as necessary, you'll be good to go. I'm going to leave some of the adventures of the plane submarine for the lead out of the video, and we're going to get to the main event, the ascent to EVE orbit. So let's get this back to orbit. I talked previously about how being able to land this thing on the Explodium Sea was a happy accident. Being able to take off from the sea was also a happy accident. It worked the first time. I hadn't planned for it or built for it. Everything worked, the S4 field tanks hold together very rigidly, and fairings are just indestructible. The biggest thing that was a problem here was that sometimes the acceleration from the ducted fan propellers would make the plane start to bob in the water a bit, and if it bobbed too much, the ducted fan blades would crash down into the explodium and be destroyed. So I'm very carefully here winding up the propeller engines using only a fraction of the available torque. And if I do do a little bit too much and it starts to bob, I'm immediately turning the engines off so the blades don't get destroyed. This is a bit disappointing because it will accelerate magnificently quickly if you do put it on full torque, but it also destroyed the propeller blades the vast majority of the time. As we get going faster, the wings start to generate lift and we start riding higher in the sea which means that I can spin the engines up more without risk. The ducted fan stage here is going to get us up to just a little less than 16 kilometers. From there, I'm going to put this into a dive, which is going to allow me to reach a higher speed before we go on to the next phase and fire up the rocket engines. Diving might seem like an odd thing to do, especially because at this altitude, we are significantly decreasing the specific impulse of the LVN engines. However, impulse is the name of the game here. Because of the constant impulse of rocket engines, they have a varying power output depending on how fast you're going. The faster we can go before firing them up, the more efficient we're going to be. For the early phase of burning the rockets, my goal is to stay level and try to generate as little drag as possible until we reach transonic speeds. Transonic speeds are, is where we're going to get the worst lift to drag ratio, and it's important that we get through this speed as fast as possible. As with the descent we did on the propeller phase, gaining speed first instead of altitude will also increase how well we're using the invariant impulse of rocket engines. Now that we're through transonic speeds and our wings are generating gobs of lift, we can allow this to naturally allow us to start climbing. This is the phase where I could actually use less lift from the wings. I'm putting the nose of this below prograde to cut into the natural 3 degree angle of attack of the wings. The wings generate so much lift at this point that this is the part of the ascent where I have more lift than I'd actually want. 
To counteract this, I'm putting the nose of the plane below prograde, which cuts into the natural three degree angle of attack of the wings. This is not ideal at all in terms of maximizing our lift to drag ratio, but it does prevent us from climbing too much, which again allows us to reach a higher speed more quickly, which I hope you've noticed by now is the number one thing you can do to increase the efficiency of rocket engines on an ascent. We do, however, still climb, and as we climb and get into the thinner atmosphere, both the lift and the drag decrease, and we now have a more appropriate amount of lift available to us from the wings. At this point in the ascent, the die is cast. There's not much efficient correction that can be made at this point. We're just going to stick prograde and hope that we've gotten everything right to get us to orbit. My first attempt while recording this mission got me to a periapsis of 89.5 kilometers. Not quite enough to be a full orbit. We'll see if this one is good. The Mammoth engines run out of liquid fuel oxidizer mix with a time to orbit of 1 minute and 50 seconds. This is slightly more time than I need to circularize with the LVN engines. You're going to see me cutting thrust to those from time to time to tune the time to periapsis. I can also tell at this point whether I have enough change in velocity for the LVNs to circularize, so this was the first point where I knew that this attempt was going to be a success. This turned out to be the best attempt I had gotten, including during the testing runs. The fact that this coincided with an attempt where I had more time to periapsis than I needed after the Mammoth engines ran out of fuel implies that I probably should have more LVN engines on this. That might be a little bit counterintuitive, but if I have more time than I needed here, that means that I could add more LVN engines and more delta V to that part of the ascent, which increases the time you need to circularize during that phase. But apparently, I do have that time. That completes the mission of the single-stage EVE cargo plane, and we're going to get back to the adventures of the EVE Marine. We've brought a 128-ton payload to EVE orbit on a single reusable stage, or 140 tons of payload depending on how much you count. Have some ideas for what should be part of a fully functional EVE base? Let me know and I'll see if I can make it work. Working on the EVE colony will definitely be an opportunity for me to get some more familiarity with the robotics parts that have been made available to us, so if you know something really cool that could be built with them, also let me know. For now, thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you appreciated this, and I'll see you next time.